Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. The topic for today is Environment Protection Act 1986. As we all know that environment protection and conservation has been a topic of debate and discussion around the world community uh, from early 60s. This topic needs a firm attention and it also needs the world community to take it seriously as playing with nature can take tolls of human life. While studying the Environment Protection Act, we will see that we will see and try to understand why we need to protect environment. We will do the in-depth provisions, in-depth study of the provisions of the Environment Protection Act 1986 and we will also try and analyze what is the judicial approach towards environmental protection. In the end, we will try and understand that this act also imposes vicarious liability on the people. Starting with, the Constitution of India clearly states that it is the duty of the state to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forest and wildlife of the country. As compared to all other previous laws of, on environment protection, the Environment Protection Act 1986 is a more effective and comprehensive measure to fight the problem of pollution. It is a general piece of legislation for the protection of the environment enacted under Article 253 of the Constitution. The objectives of the Act are, number one, to implement the decisions of the UN Con Conference, that is the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held in Stockholm in June 1972. The second objective is, it seeks or it is a general blanket law on environmental protection dealing with all kind of pollution and harm to the nature. Third, it ensures all hazards to the environment are absolutely roofed and addressed under the act. The act, the objective of the act is also to provide punishment to those responsible for causing harm to the environment. It also provides scheme for working of various already existing regulatory authorities and also creates more agencies for environment protection. Lastly, it, it promotes sustainable development to achieve the ends of prosperity. As also quoted in the case of N.D. Jayal versus Union of India, in this case it was held that if the act is not armed with the powers to ensure sustainable development, then it will be a barren shell. Sustainable development is one of the means to obtain the object and purpose of the act as well as the protection of life under Article 21. Acknowledgement of this principle will breathe new life into our environmental jurisprudence held the Supreme Court of India. There are certain important definitions which have been laid down in Section 2 of the Environment Protection Act. As per Section 2A, environment includes water, air, land and the interrelationship between them and with human beings and other living creatures. Section 2B quotes the definition of environmental pollution, pollutant which says that any solid, liquid or gaseous substance present in such concentration as may be injurious to environment is termed as environmental pollutant. As per Section 2C, environmental pollution means any environment pollutant present in the environment. As per Section 2D, handling means manufacturing, processing, Treatment, packaging, storage, transportation, use, collection, destruction and sale of any substance. The next very important definition laid down in section 2 of the act is hazardous substance. Hazardous substance has been defined as any substance which is liable to cause harm to human beings, other living creatures, plants or the environment. Occupier has been defined in the Act under Section 2 as a person who control over the affairs of the factory or the premises in relation to any substance, the person in possession of the substance. The different powers given to the central government under the Act are number 1. Coordination of actions by the state government officers and other authorities. Planning and execution of a nationwide program for the prevention and control of environmental pollution. Thirdly, laying down standards for the quality of environment. Fourth, laying down standards for discharge of environmental pollutants. 
Fifth, restriction of areas in which any industries, operations or processes shall not be carried out. Sixth, it lays down that safeguards for the prevention of accidents which may cause environmental pollution. The act also empowers the central government with laying down procedures for the handling of hazardous substances and it also says that the central government can examine such processes, materials and substances which can cause environmental pollution. It also says that central government can carry out and sponsor investigations and research relating to problems of environmental pollution. The powers also given to the central government says that they can inspect any plant, equipment, machinery, other processes by order to such authorities or officers to take steps for the prevention and control of environmental pollution. It also empowers the central government to establish or recognize environmental laboratories and institutes. Collection and dissemination of information in respect of matters relating to environmental pollutions always also falls within the purview of the central government. Preparation of manuals, codes or guides relating to the prevention and control of environmental pollution and other necessary matters. Central government feels necessary for the purpose of securing the effective implementation of the provisions of the Act under Section 3 sub clause 2 is also bestowed in the central government. Section 3 sub clause 3 gives pass to the central government to constitute an authority or authorities to assist in its functions which have been vested in the central government by this Act. In the case of F.B. Tarapurwawala v. Bayer India Limited, 1996, Supreme Court has directed the central government to constitute an authority under Section 3, Sub Clause 3 of the Environment Protection Act, 1986. The central government has constituted the Laws of Ecology, Prevention and Pavement of Compensation Authority for the State of Tamil Nadu by the orders of the Supreme Court in 1996. In the case of MC Mehta v. Union of India, 1998, the Supreme Court pointed out that the step taken by the government in constituting the Environment Pollution Prevention and Control Authority for the National Capital Region is appropriate and timely for the above authority um, is appropriate and timely and the above authority will deal with entire matters relating to environmental pollution in the NCR. Similarly, in the case of Jagannath versus S. Jagannath versus Union of India 1997, the court directed the government to constitute an authority and to confer on the said authority all the powers necessary to protect the ecological fragile coastal areas seashore, waterfront and other coastal areas and specifically to deal with the situation created by the shrimp culture industry in the coastal states and union territories. The act also under section 7 to 10 lays down the prevention, control and abatement of environmental pollution. According to section 7 of the act, it states that no person carrying on any industry, operation or processes shall discharge or emit or permit to be discharged or emitted any environmental pollution in excess of the prescribed standard. If any person is found guilty of causing damage to the environment, then by applying the very important principle that is polluter pays principle, he can be asked to pay the exemplary damage for polluting the environment. In the case of DS Rana versus Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation, AIR 2000, the imposition of restrictions on the trade or operation of melting gold and silver which was causing public nuisance and a health hazard and damaging the environment was held to be improper. Section 8 provides that persons handling hazardous substances are required to comply with procedural safeguards where the discharge of any environmental pollution in excess of prescribed standards occur or is apprehended to occur due to accident or other unforeseen circumstances, the responsibility for such discharge and the person in charge of the place where the discharge occurs shall be bound to mitigate or reduce the pollution.
He is required to give intimation and render all assistance to the concerned authorities. Under Section 9 of the Environment Protection Act, it states that on receipt of such intimation or otherwise, the concerned authority shall take steps to prevent or mitigate the environmental pollution. Section 10 of the Act provides that the central government can give any person powers of entry, inspection of any place for the purpose of examining and testing equipment, industrial plant, record, register or document and make such seizures as is necessary to prevent or mitigate environmental pollution. There are certain powers bestowed to the authorities under the Act to take samples. The samples for analysis can be taken of air, water, soil and other substances. Whereas samples can be taken from factory, premises or other places as stated in the Act. Now what are the procedures under the Act to be followed to make sample admissible as evidence in the court of law? For the sample to be made admissible as evidence, there is a certain set of procedure which is laid down in the Act which says that number one, notice must be served to the occupier or his agent or person in charge of the place. The notice must indicate the intention to have the sample for analysis. Number two, the sample must be collected in the presence of the occupier or his agent. No sample can be collected when the occupier or the agent is not present. Number three, the sample to be placed in a container or containers which shall be marked and sealed and shall also be signed both by person taking the sample and the occupier or his agent. And this sample in the fourth stage should be sent without delay the container or the containers to the laboratory established or recognized by the central government under section 12 and these laboratories are known as environmental laboratories. But in case if the occupier is absent, person shall collect sample and sign by himself. And if occupier is present but refuse to sign sample, then person who has collected sample should sign himself and send to laboratory without delay and inform the government analyst in writing of the same that the person or the occupier was present but he did not sign the same. Now, what is the procedure for disposal of the sample in the Environment Protection Act 1986? The procedure for the disposal of the sample as per the act is as follows. Number one, the central government or the officer in part shall dispose of the sample so collected as follows. One portion of the sample shall be handed over to the person from whom the sample is taken under acknowledgement. The other portions shall be sent forthwith to the environmental laboratory. Any person who fails to comply or contravenes any of the provisions of the act or the rules, orders or directions issued under the act shall be punished. Number one, with imprisonment for a term which may extend to five years. Number two, with fine which may extend to one lakh rupees. And number three, with both. In case of the second failure, additional fine of 5000 rupees for every day can be imposed. On repeating failures, offender can be punished with imprisonment which may extend to 7 years. What are the offences by companies and governments which are liable for punishment under the Act? They are number 1. When any offence is committed by the company, the company as well as the person directly in charge and responsible for the conduct and business of company shall be deemed to be guilty and liable for punishment. Number two, when an offence under this act has been committed by any government department, the head of the department shall be deemed to be guilty and liable for punishment. So, when an offence is committed by any company and government department, the liability vicariously liable lies on the head of the department. There are certain rules that have been made by the central government in order or for the effective enforcement of the Environment Protection Act 1986. These rules are the Hazardous Waste Management and Handling Rules 1989, 
manufacture storage and import of hazardous chemical rules 1989 hazardous microorganisms rules 1989 biomedical waste management and handling rules 1998 municipal solid waste management and handling rules 2000 and the batteries management and handling rules 2001 If we see the Environment Protection Act we see that a wide range of powers have been bestowed in the central government and environmental laboratories have been formed under the act in order to preserve and protect the environment to conclude we can say that the act is an important piece of legislation or we can say that it is an umbrella legislation covering all forms of environmental pollution but the act still suffers from certain lacunas such as the act talks about the criminal liability but does not talk about civil liability whereas damages are very very important to be awarded number 2 the act does not give any uh, or does not speak of any profit that the general public can get if they uh, bring the culprit to the book and it also does not prescribe the minimum sentence which the uh, wrong doer should get and in the turn the deterrent effect is minimized or diluted so we can say that the act being the umbrella legislation still suffers from certain drawbacks to conclude we can say that though the act has certain drawbacks but it has served as a positive piece of legislation to bring about awareness in the people for having sustainable development and protection and preservation of the environment it has also uh, made the uh, environment sustainability more strong and has made people aware that environment protection conservation and relishing the same is very important in order to bring about a positive change in the world and to have life surviving on the earth for long thank you